Welcome back to Jacques in the Garden. Today we have two major tasks we need to work on. One of them involves this tree right here, the calamansi, and the other one involves getting some tomatillos in the ground that are definitely ready to get in the ground, but we need to do some groundwork first and we need to build a structure to support them. So with that said, let's get started with those tomatillos right now. So to get started, what we're gonna do is loosen up the soil a little bit. I don't wanna go too hard because I actually wanna plant into this very soon. So if I dig too deep, it's going to settle too much and it'll make the plant suffer. So let's do, I don't know, maybe three inches. Since I've never actually grown in this ground right here, I'm going to make sure to add a decent amount of fertilizer here because I have no idea if it has enough to support anything. Then I'm gonna try to incorporate it a little bit deeper into the soil and make sure to pull out any rocks you find. Next, I'm gonna switch the hose over to center and try to get a little bit of moisture in. But we're probably gonna come back to this so that we can let the water soak in over time. So you can see that some of that dust is getting kicked up. And it's because the center nozzle is actually pushing the water into the soil and not just sitting on top. So now that the water is sitting on the surface, that means that we've put enough water. So let's let this soak for a bit and do a different task. Now we're over at the South Garden and you can see that once again, I am digging out my garden. Don't worry, I'm not sifting out a million roots, but I want to actually bring you in here and talk a little bit about what's going on and what I'm going to be doing to solve this problem right here. So the problem and the reason why that trench is over there is this calamansi tree right here, which has more fruit than any single household could ever eat. So what happened was when I was building this cucumber bed, I dug out a previous crop of potatoes and I found all these roots all around the potatoes. So I pulled them up, took a sniff and they smelled exactly like citrus. So I know for a fact it's from that tree back there. And that means that those roots are all throughout the garden everywhere. So we needed a solution and that's what this is back here. The first part of the solution was to dig a trench about eight inches deep. And that's just about as easy as it was to dig. I could go deeper, but I don't think there's gonna be many more roots. What I found were a few large roots like this guy here, which was, I don't know, maybe an inch and a half. I found four or five of them like that. But the big thing that I really found was a bunch of these tiny little feeder roots all along underneath the brick line here. So we needed a solution for that. So let's go ahead and take a look at that right now. The solution is 30% vinegar. So this is horticultural strength vinegar. You could spray this on weeds, things like Bermuda or roots, and it will shrivel and desiccate and kill the roots and hopefully slow them down a little bit. So what I did is I got the spray bottle here, filled it up with 30% vinegar. And just as a note, 30% vinegar is very acidic. So you don't wanna get it on your hands. And if you do, you wanna make sure you wash it. So all we need to do is spray all these little roots with the vinegar and let it sit until it dries out. I've already done this two or three times. So I'm gonna do it one more time. And while this dries out, we'll go finish up the tomatillo bed, come back here and install something to hopefully make this a permanent fix. Now that the water has soaked in and I've actually come through and done it two more times, I'm going to be topping it with compost. I'm gonna just go ahead and dump this whole five gallon bucket. I've decided what I'm gonna do is actually do 20 inch spacing. And since I have the tomatillos in deep pots, I wanna dig a pretty deep hole. And this is also going to serve a secondary purpose, which you'll see in a second. Now that we have our planting holes, I'm gonna throw in a handful of warm gold worm castings in each hole. The idea behind this is that it has a lot of micronutrients and it's also semi alive and might provide some beneficials into the soil as well. And the last thing we're gonna do is just fill the holes with water and let them permeate so that the ground gets nice and hydrated when we plant these tomatillos in. We'll know we're done when the water's totally gone. So I'll come back in about five minutes and we'll see how it's doing. Each hole has now been filled three times and it's pretty much fully drained. That one for sure has fully drained. This last one is still sitting. So that one has the worst drainage. But by now, basically the idea is that by filling this with water, it's soaked into the earth all around it at full depth. So now when we plant our tomatillos, it's gonna have some sort of water bank already into the soil right there. So without further ado, let's get these tomatillos in the ground and talk a little bit about tomatillo growing tips. Now that we have the soil deeply watered, let's get these tomatillos in the ground once and for all. Should have been planted a long time ago, but they are very healthy looking and very happy and they're actually already producing fruit. So <laughs> that's a little bit root bound, but I don't know, with tom tomatillos or anything in the solanaceous family, I don't think they get affected by root boundness as much because they could just root from anywhere that's underground. 
So I'm gonna pinch off some of the slower growth and pop this tomatillo in the ground. So an important tip to remember when you're growing tomatillos, if you've tried to grow them before and you didn't get a sufficient harvest, you actually need to have more than one plant, preferably three, because they cannot self-pollinate. They are not self-fertile. So if you only had one plant, this flower cannot pollinate itself. It needs another plant next to it to help it pollinate. It doesn't have to be a different variety, but it needs to be at least a second plant. In this case, I have two that grew in this pot and one, two over there. So I have four entirely genetically different plants, which is ideal for this pollination. Another thing to remember about tomatillos is that they are very gangly plants. They are related to the tomato, but they tend to be a lot more floppy, a lot more wild in their growth, and they really need to benefit from support. So in this case, we are gonna set up a Florida weave trellis because that's the best for dealing with a lot of this extra floppy growth. But I'm gonna pop this in the ground, then we'll grab some T-posts and get that Florida weave going. So step one is we need to hammer in some T-posts. And whenever you're doing a Florida weave, you wanna go at a slight angle away from the plants. But this isn't a very large span, so I might just go actually go for a straight down. Now that we have our T-posts in the ground, our tomatillos are in the ground, we can finally string them up using the Florida weave. So I just did a video on that when I strung up the tomatoes right behind me over here. But let's do it one more time, talk a little bit about the differences with the tomatillo. First, I'm going to start by just putting a establishing line down very low to make sure that I support just these stalks really quick. So I'll do that and then I'll talk about how to tie up tomatillos more specifically. So what you see that I, what I just did there for the Florida weave was I went in front of one tomatillo, behind another, in front of the next. And now I'm gonna come around this other T-post, wrap it around two to three times. The wrapping helps secure the string onto itself so it doesn't slip. And then we're gonna come back around and do the opposite. So this one was in front, now I'm gonna go behind. This one was behind, now I'm gonna go in front, so on and so forth. Once we get to the end, you definitely wanna pull some tension in and then we're gonna go ahead and wrap it around two to three times. Cut this excess string and tie it to the post. So there we go. Now the tomatillos have their basic support structure built. Now what we wanna do is contain some of these branches here. So let's go ahead and tie those up. When you're doing the Florida weave on a tomatillo, you wanna make sure that you are supporting these branches up high so that when they branch again, they will actually be able to then keep growing up. So what I have here are two rows of tie up. The middle one's a little bit short, but since the other ones are so tall, I'm going to go ahead and do one more wrap here just to demonstrate to you guys exactly what I'm talking about. So I'm gonna come in and I'm gonna do the triple knot. Don't want this to slip. And this is cotton butcher twine, which tends to be a little bit on the slippery side, but that's what I have on hand. So that's what we're using. We're gonna come through, we're gonna pick up the tomatillo plant and we're gonna drop the string right underneath it. So since this one is too short to really be grabbed, I'm gonna skip over it. But in this case, I went in front. So now on this plant, I'm gonna go behind it. Come back over to the trellis, give it two wraps to lock it in. And then we're gonna alternate again. So what we wanna do is pick up that branch, pick up this branch and pull it into the string. So on this side, I need to pick up that one and this one over here. So now what we have is the tomatillos are now mostly upright instead of flopping all over the place. So with tomatillos, you don't wanna go that tight like you would on a tomato. You could actually go quite tight on a tomato plant. But in this case, we're gonna leave it a little bit loose because I find that tomatillos tend to break much easier. So I'm gonna come through tie a quick single knot on the original line that I just pulled in, come back through with a double knot, and then wrap it around and tie it to the initial string that started this run. This way they're both anchored to each other and they can't actually slip. And that's all there is to tying up a tomatillo on a Florida weave trellis. While the tomatillo holes are continuing to accept that water, let's go ahead and work on this root blocker area. So what I did is I ran to the hardware store and I picked up a roll of eight inch flashing. This is material that's used for a roof so that you could waterproof certain parts of the roof, but we're gonna use it here to actually block these roots. 
The nice thing about it is that it is designed to be outside, so hopefully it won't rust very quickly. And the other nice thing about it is that it's not going to let any roots through. So I'm gonna open it carefully because it might be under so much tension that it might explode. So I just wanna be a little careful. Oh, okay. Well, that was uneventful. That's great. So you can see this material is actually pretty thin. In this case, it's a uh, eight inch by 50 foot aluminum roll flashing. That's the exact name if you wanna try to find this. So what we're gonna do is we're actually gonna roll this out and we're gonna put it up against the barrier here, which in this case is this brick. So I want it to be below the soil level so that we're not seeing it in the garden because it's not very pretty. And so what I'm gonna do is I'll probably bend it a little bit at the bottom. But before I do that, I wanna go ahead and pull out the length that I need. So I'm gonna grab a little landscape staple here, push it into the ground to kind of keep it in place. And then I'm going to go ahead and unroll this. I wanna keep it to one piece. That way I ensure that there's no gap that the roots could then push through. So I'm gonna go ahead and unroll this and we'll snip it and I'll go over how I'm gonna secure it in place. So here is the final result of burying that flashing in the trench. Probably can't tell much from this view. So here it is. So you can see right there, those are all the roots and bricks. If I put the flashing up against it, it's just below the brick level there. So on that end over there, I got one staple through it into the ground, which is holding it in place. So now we just need to secure this and backfill it so that it stays in place. This should stop all these little feeder roots or at the very least slow them down for at least a couple years. In order to keep the flashing up against the bricks while I backfill it, I've decided that I'm going to use these 12 inch landscape staples. And every couple feet, what I'm gonna do is push them into the ground as best as I can. It's actually a little bit hard here. And then try to lean them Let's see, maybe I'll do this move here. A little sidewall at an angle. So that way it's pushing up against this. So that as I add dirt back into this area, it's going to make sure that it's pressed up against this and not filling in between. Because I want this to be as flush against this as possible. So let's grab a couple more staples. So here's the next one, same idea. I think the sidewall worked really well. Try to force it in. And yep, it'll pin it right there. So now I'm gonna go ahead Put these last couple staples and then we'll backfill this and get back to Tomatillo. Here's a view from the other side. You can see the staples are all at an angle and they're pushing the slashing up against this brick line. So now we could go ahead and backfill this. And maybe we'll talk a little bit about how to install a fence as well. Now that we've buried most of the flashing, you may have noticed that I left a little patch here that's not buried. And that's because I actually need to replace <laughs> this old fence post that I had there, which you can now see is entirely run and in and out and on the verge of breaking. So let's quickly go ahead and replace that with a tree stake and I'll show you exactly how I do that. So the fence that was originally already here was two different types of fencing that met in the middle on a post. So the first thing we need to do is kind of figure out where that natural end point or meeting point is going to be. So I'm pulling this out and I'm looking at the brick line right over here and that's where I want it to go. So. What we're gonna do is we're gonna place this tree stake in the ground right there. But in order to do it really easily without having to dig into this old flashing area, we're going to use the power planter once again. I feel like I use this tool too much, but honestly, I just really find it very useful. I'm definitely using it in ways that I don't think <laughs> were the intended major use case. But anyway, here we go actually just ripped that flashing a little bit. So I definitely want to be careful. So if you're using something like a tree stake to make a fence and you've already cut it, you want to make sure that the cut side is face up and that the original end is actually buried because that has been treated with something to prevent it from rotting. So we're going to go right in and let me show you how deep this is actually going to be since I used the power planter. So I'm pinching it right there. And there we go. We have about two feet buried underground that is totally going to lock this post into place. The reason why I like using the power planter for fences is that it makes a very small hole in relation to the post itself. And that makes it a lot easier for you to sink a post in the ground and keep it secure without using concrete. 
If you dig a really big hole and then try to backfill it, it's going to be very floppy because all the earth has been disturbed. So that's kind of the primary reason I really, really like using the power planter for exactly this use case, which is making fences. And now as you backfill, there is one more thing that you want to do. So as you backfill around the fence post, the first thing you want to make sure is that it's vertical and not leaning in any direction. And then as you're putting the soil in, you want to get something like a bamboo stake or just literally a stick. And you want to smash the soil in in small additions. What this is going to do is create an extremely sturdy base at the bottom of the post. And then you're going to basically not need concrete whatsoever. So there we go. Add a little more soil and start smashing it down. And look, this is an extremely sturdy post using zero concrete whatsoever. I'm going to firm this up all around the rest of the fence line too, so that it makes sure it doesn't settle too much. But now we could actually go ahead and attach our fence to this post. All right, so I made a simple error here. <laughs> this post should have been one brick over because this is a lot longer than this piece here, but it's okay. I'm not going to redo it because I'm planning on changing this thing out anyway, pretty soon. So I just wanted to talk about a couple different ways to actually secure your fence to your post. My latest favorite is using these cabinet screws. And what they do is they have this big pan head and they're designed to be full outdoor use, treated timber, totally fine. They are a little bit pricey, but there's nothing easier than coming through and screwing through one of these cells and gripping it to the post. So these are my current favorite, but since this particular fence is a little bit short, we're going to be using zip ties because that's the only way I could really make sure that I, when I put this on here, if one of these links breaks, I could grab two of them and that way I have some insurance here. So I'm gonna go ahead and put my zip tie through and there we go. Try to get this fence pulled in as best as I can. So this is a very beat up panel of fencing here. Okay, and maybe what we could do is actually pull it in with the zip tie. Yeah, there we go. And then now we have a little bit more to grab onto. So let me show you how one of these guys work really quick. If you do want to use a cabinet screw to secure your fencing, this is my preferred method. Like I said, it's a little more expensive, but this pan head makes it very easy. So we're going to just grab a driver, in this case an impact, and we're going to jump over one extra cell in case this link breaks here, I have a backup. And then I'm going to just sink it right into the wood. And there you go. It's really hard to beat how easy that is. And it also helps pull the fence in at the same time. The other option that I've used the most in the past is this, but I've now graduated to the cabinet screws. And the stapler is fine, but it could be really annoying to perfectly line up against a linkage. So let me get this cobweb out. And you're gonna just try to center it, press it down flat, and shoot a staple in. So that works pretty well, but you have to do a lot of these for redundancy because they're not very strong and it can be tricky to drive them into some wood that's a little bit harder than this guy here. So now I'm gonna grab a zip tie and secure this top piece here because it's not very close to the fence. And I don't wanna risk using a staple. And then we'll go ahead and secure that fence and we should be set on the fence reconstruction. So here's our finished build. The fence is now back in place with the new post. And you could see that the soil is piled pretty high up here because this is going to need to settle significantly now that I've installed that flashing against here. So I really hope that this is going to be protecting us from those marauding tree roots. Let's take a quick look. I think the biggest benefactors are probably gonna be these herbs right here. They've been suffering for a while and I couldn't figure it out, but now I know the culprit is the calamansi tree. But let's take a quick look at what we did in the last vlog with this blackberry patch next to me. So this area is actually growing really well and I haven't seen any new blackberries. The green chard is growing wonderfully. It's already doubled in size. The carrots that I sowed here have fully sprouted and are now starting to really fill in. So I'm gonna have a nice carrot bed here. And then down here, I'm probably gonna put a couple flowers here because it's a little awkward, but the kale is looking wonderful. Eggplants are looking wonderful and the celery is still looking great. So no new blackberry sprouts. I'm extremely elated for that. But that's it for today, guys. I hope you guys picked up a couple little tricks and you enjoyed this vlog. I'll see you guys next time.